Hello, good morning and welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. Let me start off by saying if you live in uh, or near Chippenham, you should go to Hepcats to get your hair cut. I went there yesterday, so I've had my hair cut and my beard cut by my mate Will Hodgson. He has a lot of rare aftershaves, including one which has a picture of Christopher Lee on it from the 1970s. That's those issues dealt with. Uh, today we have, uh, it's, well, it's going to be fantastic. We have two uh, brilliant writers who are going to be talking about uh how do we make sure that people are excited by the ideas of science? How do we enthuse people, both children and adults as well? Uh, we're joined by uh, Libby Jackson and Alam Shaha. Uh, you're going to be meeting them shortly. I'll mention a couple of the normal things. If you can support us via Patreon, that would be wonderful. Uh, if you do support us via Patreon already, thank you very much. Uh, you just need to go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles. And we've got loads of new stuff coming up, including uh, the latest episode of Tips for Existence is uh, with the sporting crooner. David Baddiel, uh, where we talk about many different uh, ideas, including his uh, play that he wrote, God's Dice, which is all about uh, quantum mechanics, which is uh, a, a very interesting place. So we talked about that. That is up on Tips for Existence. We've got a new series of Uncanny Hour starting very soon. And I think the first episode of that is going to be all about Alan Garner and uh, his book, The Owl Service, and also the TV adaptation of that. And the current book shambles is uh, with uh, Pragya Agarwal, who is fantastic. We've talked to her before on Book Show was her latest one is a book called now Josie Long and I couldn't decide exactly how to pronounce it because it's basically M in brackets then otherhood so is that m otherhood is it motherhood anyway is it anyway so we're not entirely sure how to pronounce the book but what I can tell you is having read it it is a fantastic book and well worth your time so that's currently up on book shambles and uh, also uh, there's going to be uh, some shambles at latitude uh, Helen's going to be there Dean Burnett's going to be there Tams and Edwards and others as well so let's straight away I think I've covered pretty much everything there also if you happen to be at the gig that I did in Bath last night Thank you very much. You were a very nice audience. Helen Chersky, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm quite I'm quite excited by the mention of Alan Garner because the I come from uh, the south of Manchester and his books were famously very locally based and there's this one very strange geological feature in Cheshire called Alderley Edge, which is full of copper mines and it's got all these tunnels in it. Um, and he set his books, uh, especially the Weirdstone of Brisingamon, in and around the mines. And so I always loved those because as I was growing up, you know, we weren't allowed in the mines because, you know, people had invented health and safety by then, although there were organised trips. But I just um, what I loved about it was taking something that was so real to me and setting a science fiction thing very specifically in a real thing that if, you, if you're a local, it kind of means a lot to you. So I loved his books. Um, and there is also that beautiful thing as, as some of the documentaries, in fact, which are think, online from the 70s and 80s, where you see him both talking about this kind of fantastic mystical world and this kind of almost block universe that he creates in that area. But he's there in Jodrell Bank. So you see this great meeting of the different things that human minds can create. Yeah, yeah, it was it, that that area of Cheshire is um, a little bit hard to get to sometimes, but it's 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 full of it's full of stories, which is great. Uh, but I have a story. So for this week in science, uh, and so I was thinking because we're talking about children and science today, it occurred to me that a lot of the science we talk about, I mean, it almost never involves children, right? It's it's kind of neutron stars or how to design a new clarinet or something. It's not something that is specifically child focused. But this week, there is an anniversary, which is very specifically child focused. It's a, it's a sad story with a happy ending, I think. Um, and it is the anniversary that in July 1952, Jonas Salk, started the first trials of his new polio vaccine on children. And this was very specifically a childhood disease uh, in the 1940s and 50s. It it was terrifying. It, it, result, it was a spinal disease. It resulted quite often in uh, paralysis or near paralysis. And, and children got it. It wasn't, an, although adults could get it, the, the consequences were most severe for children. And so he um, found, used a new a new method, a different method, to try and make a vaccine, which was to take the polio virus, because it was a virus, and uh, basically dunk it in formaldehyde, which stopped it working, but kept all the, it made, you know, it looked the same, so your immune system could recognise it, but it stopped it causing disease. And so it was in July 1952 that he first injected it into children. Um, so that was the first trial, it was a bigger trial, and just nine months later, he announced that it was safe, it was effective. And I think within two years, they had done a trial with a million children. 
Um, and another two years after that, basically polio had almost vanished from America. So we talk about vaccines now and how quickly they can be rolled out. And it did take them a while to work out how to make the polio vaccine. But Jonas Salk was the superstar of his day for coming up from this vaccine. Like he would walk down the street and it was like, you know, some A-lister. Um, one of the few times in, in history when people really recognised the scientist and they recognised him in particular because it was science that meant something to them. It was their kids that had the vaccine and and this guy had been the one that, that made it possible. There were developments after that. Polio has now nearly been eradicated. But it's a very, it's a sort of child-focused story. And he was, the, the other thing about it is all these echoes in the modern day that he said he didn't try and patent it. He said, humanity owns this it should just be available to everyone. And so he never made any money from it. Um, and he was quite puzzled when people said, well, you know, aren't you rich now? And he was like, well, no, I've just, you know, everyone hasn't got polio. That's fine. So it was just, I, I just wanted, that was the bit of, of history from this week. And and it's, it's funny how history comes around in circles, right? Polio wasn't an epidemic, a pandemic in the same way that, that COVID is, but it was a very serious disease. And uh, it was a big deal when a vaccine was discovered and he was the guy who discovered it. Yeah, it's, uh, it is fascinating, isn't it? When you talk to the, the you know, a generation slightly older than me, as you said, it, the, an, an, an enormous, and of course, for those of us who are growing up with the Ian Jury and people like that, where, you know, many people in the public sphere who you would go, you'd find out they had polio as children. I will, will mention, because you're mentioning vaccines, that on Tuesday at the How-To Academy, uh, I am talking to uh, Sarah Gilbert and uh, Catherine Green um, about uh, the development of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. So uh, that's on Tuesday night. Thank you for that, Helen. Um, Libby, good morning. Good um, morning. You are author of one of my favourite children's books uh, for uh, children, which I absolutely love, which was your, your book, uh, Galaxy of Her Own. Uh, the amazing stories of of women in space and since then I've not been keeping up because you have another one as well. I do I've written a second one called Space Explorers Um, it tells it's 25 bedtime stories for children and really what I wanted to do was capture fascinating stories that I loved when I was little and, and when I sort of got into adult books when I was a bit older that excited me about space particularly what happened in the early days with the first people to go there, the moon landings and so on, but also all the other amazing stories that have happened as I've worked my way through the space industry and been part of it, and I've worked in mission control and alongside astronauts and all sorts of amazing things, and tell them in a way that is completely true, um, but for th- uh, in a way that I hope sort of younger people can can read before bed or get involved in to, to show them how amazing and exciting um, space exploration can be. I've got a copy here. If people can see it's called Space Explorers. It's out now in hardback. Paperback is out uh, in September. The audio book is coming soon. And if you've got international listeners tuning in, it's out in the US in August as well. Can I ask you, there's one thing which I'm always amazed at how few people have heard it, which was I was talking to Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9 uh, for a Tips for Existence uh, on, on Friday. And his speech in Lindisfarne, which was this, not Lindisfarne in in, uh, in the north of England, Lindisfarne, which was kind of a, a, a community, uh, I think up on Long Island. He did this speech five years after basically having this chance to do a spacewalk where suddenly a camera jammed and he just had that rare moment in those missions where he could just stare out for a little bit. And he had this incredible process. And then five years later, he makes this speech and suddenly everything that he's, he's, he experienced comes together. And I find it, do you know, have you have you ever seen this or, or heard his Lindisfarne speech? No, I'm going to go and find this immediately after this. I've not come across this. This is amazing. It is such a, because I think Apollo 9 is a very interesting mission. I think because it didn't go to the moon, yeah. even though it was incredibly important for some reason, even in some of the books about all the Apollo missions, they kind of go, oh, yeah. And then they just kind of tested the lunar module in space for a little bit. Let's move on to Apollo. You know, it's just, yeah, it's, it, it's odd. I will find that there are so many um, unsu- unknown and unsung stories. I loved getting into them and discovering things. But for all the years, I, I've not come across um, that. But there are definitely moments. One of my favourites is that I didn't know for a long time 
you talk, we go straight to Apollo 11 and, you know, the big stories of that. But if it wasn't for a felt tip pen, Neil and Buzz would have got stuck on the surface of the moon. Um, and then years later, which is something I worked on, um, we had a big problem on the International Space Station. There was a bolt that got stuck. It was taking out all the power. And the amazing people in Mission Control fixed it with a toothbrush. And they now still take a toothbrush out on spacewalks every time just in case they need to clean these bolts out. And it, it's the little things like that that, to me are so so hidden in behind the the amazing excitement of the big amazing pictures and the big amazing tales of exploration um and th there's another moment that's not in the book but but similar to rusty um when tim peak was out on his spacewalk they just got to hung out, hang out because they were waiting for the sun to set and look at just look at the beauty of it uh, and i think that was one of tim's favorite moments from his mission um and it is it's just a beautiful beautiful place with lots and lots of things to explore and i hope i've brought some of those stories out in the book well it's human isn't it what's it that for like for years there's been this the, the narrative has been it's the big story that matters mm. the big story is that humanity did a thing the americans did a thing in competition with the russians but anyway um but what that dehumanizes it and it takes it away from all those tiny little problem solving things that actually make it a fun and satisfying job to do and exactly. we're very bad at telling those stories partly because there's no critical one usually it's just another little problem you solve another little problem and another little problem and it's the little things that that get big things done and you know I, I tell my students that it's there isn't there's no such thing as a big thing there's just lots of little things and yet we're very bad at, we want to tell oh there's a big thing it was really just lots of little things it's just when you look back afterwards it looks like a big thing and it it really it's, I think it's a really important way of talking about science like the, the the problems I can solve as a human well I'm not floating in space but you know rather than impossible problems it takes a million people to solve it is. It's typical and physicist, isn't it, that, of you, though? Look at that, look at that beautiful it? big thing. It's just loads of little things put together. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I'm all right with that. And I it's don't care if I'm spoiling your fun, so there. Yeah. <laughs> It's loads of things, but it's also loads of people doing it. I think that's the other point. And, and Robin, you mentioned my first book, but but people see these astronauts going up. They're doing the big things, but it is the little things. There's, there's thousands and thousands of people get involved um, in all of this to make it happen. And I hope anyone who's listening and goes, oh, yeah, space, brilliant. I can get involved in that. That's always a big message for me is that, is that anyone of any age can come and join in because there's so much opportunity in, in so many different areas. And I also think that's true of any area you care to think of. It's always the little things. There's always the people behind the scenes. Um, and there's always a job for anyone in any area if you want to, you know, go find it. You do whatever you like. Brilliant. Now, have you got a show and tell for us today? I do. Do. Talking of science and little people. I've got this now. I don't know if you can see this. This is a, a folder, a stripy folder. And if you look really, really carefully, this is my science folder from when I was at school in years five and six. Um, and I put this all together years ago, like 20 years ago. I was clearing things out and my parents said, oh, you've got to get rid of it. And I hung on to my <laughs> science folder, which which I love because it's it was just, you know, this is me aged eight or nine. Um, and buried in here, there's all sorts of things and where I learned about, um, you know, science and physics and how the human body is put together and what we're supposed to eat. And there's something here about um, how we see and, and, and how we correct eyesight and, you know, terribly useful for me now. But something that I hung on to in here that I wanted to show you, so I get through it. Um, there's a bit of the solar system was this. And if you can see it, this is my... Um, visit Mars once in a lifetime experience <laughs> and it's so topical today this was my um travel brochure and what we had to do when we were I say I was in about year year five or six I was I was nine or ten we were sent home from um school over the summer holidays probably and told to write a travel brochure of somewhere we really wanted to go to and what our teachers wanted us to do was go into travel agents when they used to exist on the shops and get a sort of brochure or two and pick out some pictures of Italy or America or somewhere we would really like to travel to and I decided I wanted to travel to Mars so I didn't pick out the pictures I just um wrote my own travel brochure and this is this is all about how you get there and I drew pictures of you know, I drew pictures of the hotel you'd be staying in on Mars and how it was all terraformed um 
and they get was, there was an amusement park that was very colourful that was all in domes, and it was the bargain price of twenty six thousand pounds, which I think was amazing for a trip to Mars. But I love going back to that because it it reminds me that I been fascinated by space you know when I was growing up and it comes back to what I was just saying if you want if you like something there's a job in it but this weekend Richard Branson is finally hopefully possibly kicking off the world of commercial space tourism and people can now buy tickets and go to space um, and I find that absolutely mind-blowing and I mean this when I, when I say to young people today you can go to space I, I mean it if they start saving now um, just a little bit, you know, and, and put it away. I really think by the time young people are, are, are my age, you know, 40 and 50, they can have saved enough, anyone, to to buy a ticket to space. And it's not going to be cheap. I'm not, I'm not, you know, but it's it's going to be something in the future that you can choose to save up money and do and go. And I think that is, it's just phenomenal that we've gone from, Apollo and, and the moon landings and the things I, I get involved in today, which is big exploration um, that suddenly, you know, people can go to space and buy a ticket and go to space. And what a thing for, for young people today to sort of see and, and think about that they can do that one day. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, we will be talking more about that in a, in a moment. We're also joined by Alan Sharma, who wrote, well, first, his first book actually was called The Young Atheist Handbook. And if you've not read it, I really highly recommend it. It's a very beautiful book and a very personal book about that particular story of of, of, of his life. But now he has Mr. Shaha's Marvellous Machines, which came out last week. Uh, fantastic selection of, you always, I mean, the thing about you, Alan, is we should mention how people get into science, which is you were not at school someone who really, really science wasn't going to be your thing was it you you imagined you were going to go more into the kind of the art side of stuff yeah absolutely it's really fascinating uh, hearing Libby talk and I think we come from the same place of wanting kids to feel that science is something they could do um, and I feel very strongly what you what you've just said about um, children being able to go to space like, I tell my students that like they can be astronauts like they, they literally can be astronauts and and if they have a big idea like that, there's no reason why at their age they can't start pursuing it. But for me, you know, I didn't really get into science until I was a teenager and um, had a couple of really great teachers who helped me get science for the first time. And um, in science communication, uh, people talk about this thing called science capital and the idea that if you grow up with parents who are scientists or parents who are just interested in science and have a positive view of science, for example, take you to the science museum or buy you books about space, that's likely to predispose you to doing better at science in school uh, and so forth. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm a kind of anomaly in that model in that I didn't have any science capital really uh, growing up uh, until I got to school and, and the teachers kind of introduced me to it. So I feel really strongly that science is like you, Robin, that, you know, everyone gets exposed to music unless they're very unlucky and literature and art, because those are considered part of our cultural heritage. Everyone, regardless of kind of socio-economic background, ethnicity or whatever, those are things that just seem to be taken for granted. And I, I, I am constantly pointing out to people that science is also a kind of human cultural endeavour. It's something that humans do uh, and it's there. And I, uh, it's there for engaging with, you don't have to grow up to be a scientist, but just, just as we engage with music and we don't all grow up to be rock stars, unfortunately, you know, science is something that enriches our lives and Unfortunately, I think it, it is different to art and music in that engaging with it isn't quite as straightforward as, you know, putting a bit of music on or looking at a piece of art. But I, I'm really keen to get people who were like me growing up, who, who didn't really have any um, any exposure to science in a meaningful way, to, to, to see that they can and to help parents who perhaps feel that they don't have the confidence to talk about science or even bring it up with their children, that actually... It is like listening to music and art in that actually you just have to take it and and look at it or, or listen to it or whatever. And and I think that's where my science communication has led me in, in the last few years. Um, and that's probably come from being a teacher, but also thinking about what matters to me as a as a social justice warrior. There you go. I've said it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think we all care about the similar sorts of issues and for me you know science has been 
uh, it's en enriching literally in that it's given me my career it's given me my job uh, um, it's made me money and so forth but also enriched me in the same way that art and literature does and I know you talk about this a lot Robin you, I mean you're you're the man to talk about that but um, uh, you know this book Marvelous Machines it's not for you guys and it's not for people like you and or your children in that you probably know how to do the stuff and you probably know how to talk about the stuff and and it's not it's not even aimed at people who are makers in that you know if you're a maker if you if you if you're the kind of person who buys lego techniques and does that with your kids it's for people who really haven't got a clue uh, like my my dad would have been and uh, so some of the things in it are really uh, i suspect the science communicators that i know think oh that's really obvious or why is he why is he dedicated a page to that um and it's because I, I know people i've grown up with people for whom all these things are new um and so I, I hope it reaches those people and that's really the challenge for 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 me and i suspect for you so we talk about hard to reach audiences or whatever and um you know from for me i really want to get the book into the hands of people who wouldn't otherwise pick up a book like that and part of the trick with that with the first book was calling it recipes for wonder and not having science in the in the main title um i don't know if that worked but you know anyway i'm rambling uh. but i was i was going to say i mean that's one of the things when we, we talked a while ago about and you were talking about teaching what might be called the kind of you know the bottom set the people who've kind of been oh well they're not going and, and not going right this is what they have to be taught for the curriculum right so whether you're interested or not here is this equation and you were talking just about setting fire to those I forget those little kind of biscuit wrappers you know those ones here that so that just the way that they would they will flow and that was just to do that for for a whole lesson and just go wow wow let's have a look at that again let's what what is going on and that to me to have that time and to make that time, especially as we know, there's a lot of battles sometimes with education secretaries who don't seem to realise the importance of just being lured into a world before you're going, here's this, look at this, learn this. Why do you want to learn it? Why do you? And I think you do that so well with just going, well, that's just, just a brilliant thing. Oh, and it's science. Yeah. But the first thing is it's a brilliant thing. No, I, th I think, I mean... You probably know from my other work that I'm I'm really a big fan of the use of demonstrations in science teaching. I think they're a really powerful pedagogical tool. And I, I, I think joy and wonder are things that you can use to your advantage as a teacher. And so um, the, the demo you're talking about is the, the, the burning tea bag rocket or whatever. And I, I think having interesting physical phenomena which children can do for themselves and, and, and using that as a way into a discussion or whatever it is really powerful um and and i guess that's what the the two books recipes for wonder marvelous machines are about which is just to to say to people look j just have a look at this and, and that's about i think that's where science starts really i think science starts with people who who look at the world i know that sounds maybe that sounds insulting to some people but i don't think everybody really looks at the world and you know I've got most talk. people don't really look at the world i mean one of the things sorry i think that's, a lot of people think they look at the world yeah but they look at what's presented to them and actually that habit of continually being a child of looking at things and saying why is a and, habit that yeah and um, it's interesting uses. i think it's it's is it robert Oppen was robert oppenheimer the one who worked on the bomb uh, yeah. yeah okay so his brother whose first name i can't remember is another oppenheimer uh, who also worked on the bomb and then went off to be a, a science teacher and he became very frustrated that his students didn't really look closely at things and that's why he set up the exploratorium in uh san francisco which is uh the best science museum in the world i think it's just amazing if you haven't been and you get the opportunity to go but uh, you know i think looking closely at the world is the first step towards a real interest in science and um what i've tried to do with these two books is just give parents a, a really easy way to get their student, their, their children doing that and carers and and anyone who works with um, children and uh, what I'm trying to do with my own children is like I, I do point out things to them when we're out and about but children do tend to look a bit more closely I don't know if we lose that or, or something and I'm, I'm certainly not a fan of you you yeah, Robin and Helen will know that I'm not a fan of the idea that children are born scientists or whatever. I, I think science is a, a, a specific set of skills that, that we, we need to learn about. But I think there is a, a natural inquisitiveness, perhaps, that, that somehow gets uh, lost. And I, I don't know what the reasons are, but I think as parents or people who work with children, we can nurture uh, that, that 
instinct again and through showing them interesting things and so for example you you know just last week I had the opportunity I've had a really lovely time I'm at a new school and uh I have been for a few months but and they um they gave me a weird timetable where with one of the classes the year sevens they said oh you can do whatever you want with them you're only you've only got them for 40 minutes do do interesting things with them and so I I've just been making stuff with them and and looking at designing experiments and so forth but going off curriculum which is such an amazing privilege really um and uh, just uh this week we made uh, the balancing bird which is one of my favorite things I'm, I'm, can i go into show and tell now yeah go into um, show and tell yeah so a balancing bird is uh one of these things which you can buy in, in a shop it's made of plastic it's got two massive chunks of metal in it um and and i've used this for teaching about moments but um I just did it as a fun activity with this class and you don't need to buy one, you can make one. Uh, here's one I made from a bit of cardboard with some 2P coins stuck on it. It's, it's really easy to make um, and it does exactly the same thing. So what a balancing bird does uh, is it, it balances in a quieter and I, you probably don't get this off the screen, but if you plonk that on a kid's finger, uh, they, they find it absolutely delightful. And what, what's great is that you can, you can do it with a, you can do it with my my paper version. It's just as delightful and they, they get to make it. So this is the paper version. And I made, I made 30 of these the other day. And I promise you what I got them to, I got them all to make it. And then I went round, I picked that, I said, put your finger out. And they put their finger out and I, I then put it on their finger. And so I should just, perhaps just hold it sideways so we can see the, okay uh yeah so the birds so that's what's weird about it right is that you're kind of it's on your finger at the end yeah it's really disconcerting in real life so <laughs> um it is genuinely surprising even to adults um and there's a moment of joy and if, you, if you're using it you can use it either to introduce the idea of center of gravity and moments and so forth or you know i i just used it as a activity to bring joy <laughs> which i think is absolutely fair enough and i wish i'd kind of photographed or videoed the faces of these children because it, it just you see it almost every time almost every child has has this moment of wow that's odd or wow that's unusual and i think that can be for for a lot of us who grow up to be scientists it's that moment where we go wow that's odd or that's really interesting i wonder why that happens and i want to know more about this um and it's it's weird because um, I'm, I'm I'm a very very bad amateur magician, um, but what I why I why I learned some magic was for me I, I just always wanted to know how the trick works. And a lot of people think, oh, when you know how it works, it spoils the magic. And for me, no. Like I love knowing how magic tricks work, and uh, the cleverer they are, the more I love them. And I I, I do think there's a parallel with science. Um, and with with this, it's it, it they they know it's not a magic trick. It's, they know it's not a trick, and so. I think they do want to know why does it behave like that? Why? And I've not, I've not encountered that. I didn't know the world behaved in this way. How, how is that possible? And I think that that's a really good starting point to 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 lead to discussion. And that's really uh, it's weird because I'm a formal science educator in that I, I have to teach the curriculum and I do spend uh, a lot of my working life teaching GCSE and A level science and key stage three science and so forth. Um, and I think. I'm sad to say, I don't think that works for a lot of people, you know, I think I think school science doesn't work for a lot of people. And that's why uh, people grow up, I, you know, I meet so many people, as I imagine you do, say, oh, I hated science at school. And there are reasons for that. There are all sorts of reasons for that. But just like you, you parents can engage their children with music and art and literature that they don't engage with in school for whatever reason, I do feel strongly that we can we can do more to provide ordinary parents who aren't scientists or whatever just the ability to to let their children know that you know science doesn't have to be what it is in schools and and that and that's can you know, I wonder of it because they they'll enjoy it those parents when you do a balancing bird yeah. you know I'm going to make one of those I've got a two p jar so uh, I can make loads of them I, in fact I might start you know selling them on this now that probably has copyright infringement things we should okay. now get because we don't normally get to ten thirty without having the first audience question we should probably now get get to them but that is fantastic and I think that's such an important thing as you said your your books as well and I don't think it matters even if you are ready to science they are still fun you don't you don't have to lose that bit of just going oh well I kind of do understand some of those things I do Lego they are still 
they're engaging i think for, for for everyone who just likes mucking about and then wondering why things are as they are let's say, start off with a question for you libby from abby uh abby would like to know how high up in the sky could you go without a spacesuit before you die <laughs> die <laughs> uh, well what a great question the answer is probably not as high as you would think. And the thing that is going to kill you before anything else is lack of oxygen. We all need oxygen to breathe. It's got to go in our lungs. Um, and actually, you can't go very high up at all. You think if you've ever been uh, out walking, you know, in the hills or you go and climb up, uh, perhaps in this country, climb up Snowdon or Ben Nevis. Maybe you've gone over to Europe and you're up in the mountains. It gets harder to breathe uh, the further up you go. I know I was um, very uh, lucky. I got to go um, walking in Nepal, um, which is you know, where Everest is. You land there, you get out the plane, you start walking, you go, oh, I really, I can't breathe. And that's because there's, the air is thinner, there's less oxygen available to your lungs, which is what you need to keep breathing. And so if you go really high up, um, the thing that you need is to be able to breathe. If you go all the way to the top of Everest, um, most climbers who do that need to take oxygen with them to keep breathing, to keep uh, being able to move. Um, now, so when um, I was having a look, so how how high up could you go? Really, so basically, the answer is if you go up to the top of Everest, which is about where aeroplanes fly as well, you're going to need <laughs> some help breathing. When Felix Baumgartner um, jumped out of a capsule, he went up, and I've got the number here to check it, he went up to 24 miles um, in a big balloon that just lifted him up and up and up, and then he jumped out. He needed a, a spacesuit then uh, to keep his um, body at the right temperature because it gets very cold up there, it's the air. Um, but it, what really he really, really needed was um, oxygen to be able to breathe because if it had just jumped out of the plane at 24 miles up uh, with nothing to breathe, he would have asphyxiated pretty quickly and it would not have been such a good jump down. So there you go. The answer is not very high at all. Thank you for that question, Abby. Uh, Maria would like to know, Alon, uh, what's the most impressive mousetrap style machine that you have ever made? So let's know a little bit about these mousetrap style machines that you've been creating. Uh, the most impressive one that, I, one that I've made or I've helped to make, um, I did a, a TV series with Brian Cox, who some of you may have heard of, uh, uh, it was about the history of particle physics and for the opening of one of those we we built a, a mousetrap machine uh, which are notoriously difficult to film but uh, I built it with the help of a chap called Marty Jobson and so we built one for TV one of those proper ones which was quite well, can, nice. Can you yeah. explain it a little bit for those who aren't quite sure when you say a mousetrap machine what, what, what exactly are you creating? So I think somebody made a film and you can look this up on YouTube called The Way Things Go is, is probably the most famous one. And there's a band called OK Go who also have done a spectacular one, but it, it's where it's like, if you know what a domino rally is where a domino knocks one over and then the next one over and the next one over and so forth. It's like something like that, but not using dominoes, just using anything you can get your hands off that moves to, to start one thing moving and then another thing moving and then another thing moving. And they're, they're really delightful to make if you've got the time and the space and it's an activity I used to do with my six formers um, to, as a kind of getting to know each other activity and I used to challenge them to make a party popper pop um, so you can get it to do something and I think the OK Go video does something quite spectacular but um, it, or sometimes they're called chain reaction machines so yeah I, I've been lucky enough because I used to work in TV to make a really quite good one um, but at home now with, with my daughters, um, we just we've got a marble run toy and uh, just using marbles and bits of card, you, you can probably knock one up at home that is sufficiently. I think even if you do a, a domino run, it's initially impressive. And then with a bit of imagination, you can just start building on it. But, yeah, I've been lucky enough to do one on telly. So. The perfect ones are those ones which have that element of cyber being at the uh, the Glasgow Museum of Modern Art had an incredible film of one. And you get to that point as, as it goes round and round a room, all of the different kind of and then you go, oh, no, the candle on roller skates isn't going to manage to go down that slope. And there's that little bit of suspense. They go, oh, yes, it has. The momentum is built. That's what that's what I love about watching those huge ones. Um, uh, this is a question for you, Libby, from Danielle. Why don't rockets have wings like planes? Wings like planes. Ah, oh, fantastic question, Danielle, and hello, Danielle. 
Some of them do, some of them don't. It depends really about what they're going to try and do when. Um, and it comes back to that first question when we were talking about oxygen and air. <coughs> um, wings on aeroplanes are designed um, to keep the aeroplane up in the air because they use air pressure. And we need that air pressure down here on Earth. We have that, um, you, can, you can fly a plane through the air um, you use something that's called the Bernoulli effect um, and you get the, the angle just right and it gets the lift and that's what keeps an aeroplane up in the air as, as, as you move through it. Up in space, we, there is no air. So those wings are useless to us because you can't position them uh, to get any lift to, to control uh, what's going on. And so that's why um, up in space, uh, when you have a spacecraft and you have a spaceship, they can be all kinds of weird, odd shapes and sizes because you're not worrying about what's going on in the air. So that's sort of why you, some do and some don't. But then you get some interesting things which are designed to work both up in space and down um, on the Earth. And you start getting sort of interesting wings and shapes and, and so on. Um, so you look at the space shuttle. If you remember that, that was the, the spacecraft I grew up with. Um, it launched like a rocket. Um, this, the space shuttle was the American uh, spacecraft. Uh, looked a little bit like an aeroplane. Launched into space with rockets pushing it up into space to, to accelerate it out into space. Um, once it was up in space, the space shuttle could open its payload doors. It flew upside down. It was, it was really a spacecraft. But it landed on a runway. And that's why it had um, these wings so that as it re-entered uh, the Earth's atmosphere, it could glide. Uh, the pilots who, who controlled it, so it was a bit like a flying brick. It wasn't as graceful um, or as responsive as the beautiful gliders that you get um, the sort of soar around um, up in the air for ages. But it was able to use the uh, the um, the air as it came back into the atmosphere, it got thicker and thicker, and, and then it landed um, on a runway. And so that's why you, you do um, have some, depends what you want to do and where you're flying, basically. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and this is from Adela, who's age nine, and uh, was wondering what would happen if a rip in the fabric of space took place? So it's not an uncommon question because there's lots of sci-fi thing things suggesting that space can get ripped. Um, it's There are subtleties in the answer because if you have a rip, it sort of implies that there's a you can have a hole um, and we don't know of any holes like that in space. It's not like a black hole. A, a rip sort of implies there's some stuff on one side and if you go, you can't jump across to the other side because there's something else in the gap or maybe nothing. And space doesn't work like that. So you, we don't know of any way to rip space because space is all there is. The universe, space time together is that, that defines what the universe is. As far as we know, it's continuous except at black holes, which means <laughs> that you can always travel across it. You might not always go in what feels like a straight line, but you will always you can always travel across it. So the surface itself doesn't break. So we don't know of any rips. There are black holes where you can disappear down them uh, and you might not ever come back up, depending on how you think about a black hole. I've got this interpretation where a black hole is just a a collapse that's a collapse and a re-explosion that's happening very slowly. Um, so no to the rips in space time, sadly, although it'd be lovely to have. Wormholes are theoretically possible, I think, in very constrained circumstances, not anything you could send the Starship Enterprise through. Um, so there's no worry. Don't worry about anything ripping space time. That's, that's not. There are lots of things to worry about in the universe, but that is not one of them, I would say. Because that that was one of the theories, wasn't it, of the end of the universe? Katie Mack writes about it in her book *End of Everything*, doesn't she? The big rip of, uh, but th that's quite low down, isn't it? On the, I think that's the kind of number four on the possibilities of the end of the universe, isn't it? Which is many, many billions of years away. So, um, and by <laughs> so that time, so by not to panic. By then... <laughs> You're looking at the big picture. <laughs> that's why the small things are more fun. Um, but but you know, so there are there are big questions about what, what happens before the universe and after the universe. Um, but that's a sort of separate category of problem. The universe itself is is, as far as we know, intact and staying that way. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. We've got a lot of other things to deal with before we start worrying about the uh, the end of the universe. Now, this is something you've been talking about a long already to, to some extent, but it might be nice just to have a, a, a very specific, I suppose, onto this. Uh, Peter wants to know any tips on tricking the kids into doing a science activity? Uh, so what I again, we, we, we were talking about that beautiful, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the tea bag rocket, the uh, what is um, are, are, name another one where you just you've really noticed that kind of engaging people and they don't even know that there's science going on the science going on I, th I think that's literally the whole book there's that you, you can do every activity in the book and not engage with the science you don't have to and uh, you know uh Libby was talking earlier about how things fly and wings and so forth and understanding how a wing, wing works so you know throwing a paper airplane is is fun my four-year-old has gotten really good at fr throwing paper airplanes um but if you want to work out why does a paper airplane not follow a, tr a parabolic trajectory um it's because um a paper airplane experiences lift right it's just that that's to explain how a paper airplane works you need to think about the physics of it so uh, I, I think that's what marvelous machines is about like you, you can enjoy making them and playing with them but actually the next step is to think about how they work so I, th I think doing anything which leads your child to ask how does that work or how can i make that better or um why doesn't that work that is uh, i don't like the phrase tricking them into doing science but yeah you know that that's the whole point that if you can show a child something that they're interesting in and that they want to know more about that is tricking them into doing science right Yes, that, so I, 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 the, the answer is Pete. Uh, this. Um, well, there's also something in there. Sorry to interrupt. There, there is this, this, this. The thing that adults, I think, have forgotten to ask is that. Well, let's find out. Yeah. I yeah. think a lot of adults feel they don't know, and so they sort of. I think this is why kids stop asking after a while because they just they just know there are some things that are unknowable, so they're not going to find out, and they just yeah. get shut down. And actually, the thing that I remember my parents saying is, well, well, let's find out, and they didn't know. <laughs> But they'd go, OK, well, let's plant an avocado seed or let's, you know, make it backwards and see what happens. And and that in itself, mm. like as soon as you get the question, you can open it out instead of closing it in. And that's, that's right. the single biggest thing, I think. And it's true of teachers as well. I, I write about the power of I don't know in, in Recipes for Wonder. And I think you're good teachers, you're confident teachers. If you're a really good teacher, you need to be confident enough to say, I don't know. And I always say, like. You need if if you're confident enough to say I don't know how can we find out that then you know you're probably safe in the classroom you don't need to feel embarrassed and in fact it's it's a very powerful thing to do and I, I'm sure I, I read somewhere recently about needing teachers to say, science teachers particularly to say I don't know because you, you I think that liberates children to 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 know that not knowing is okay and actually it's the first step in a journey so yeah i absolutely agree with you but and you're right it's, it's about letting them ask the question and not closing closing that down but yeah i'm not going to plug i should plug the book i think like the first book recipes for wonder and and in this book it as well as having the activities it, it, both books have um guidelines for parents to help them with the with these questions um, so one of the reasons why the book, the first book, people kind of publishers were like, oh, this is a bit of an odd book because it's not written just for children. It's literally written for parents and children to, to, to use together because I, I, I realise that I'm not writing a book for children and I'm not writing a book for adults alone. It, it's a book for both of them. So if you read the book, I, I think there was initially some concern that uh, who are you addressing this bit to and who are you addressing? And I'm like, well, it says here this is for the adults, so that's who I'm addressing it to. Let let them read it. It's okay to have a book that is partly for adults and partly for children to, to work together, and that makes sense to me. But you know, Libby, I'm sure you know what publishing is like. Um, well, I was just going to say, I I, was say, I I think I don't know is so powerful for everybody. I think everyone needs to go. I don't know. I used to work in mission control. And you know, and we're talking about it in the book about how the mission control people solve stuff. They solve stuff when we go, here's a problem. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to go and find out. And and that that single thing, for it, whether it's anything in life, just being able to say, I don't know, but let's go find out. It opens doors to everything. Absolutely, yeah.
answer to the next question i'm going to ask you then libby because uh, that might be more empowering than actually getting an answer because it's christoph age seven who says could we see the, i think you will have an answer for this though could we see the american flag on the moon from earth with a big enough telescope well i don't know but i can tell you what, but i can tell you what i think so there's two things here um first of all uh, can we see the things from the american missions on the moon and the answer today is yes we can we've now got big enough telescopes that aren't on Earth, but we've got things that are orbiting the moon that are taking photographs. And it was the most amazing thing, even to me, when we first saw the images coming back um, of the landing sites, you could see where the lander was, you could see the tracks of the footprints and uh, the, the tracks made by the rovers. Um, you, could, you can see where they've gone, like all those people who, we won't even talk about them, um, somehow think it didn't happen. There it is, there's the photographic evidence. Could you see the flag? Well, those flags uh, were pretty flimsy. And when the uh, lander lifted off to take the, space, the, the two astronauts back to the command module to bring them home, um, there was quite, we're back to air now and, and rockets, but you had to use a rocket to push, push themselves off because because there's no air on the moon. It created some force with the, with the plumes, which knocked the flags over. So those flags are now somewhere flat there. And it kicked up some dust and that dust probably covered the flag. And there's been bombardment of, of rocks and things on those places. So what I don't know, because I've not really done all the working out, is whether the flags are flat on the floor. And if you had a big enough telescope, you could see them or whether they've got covered by dust um, from from that rocket blasting off to take uh, the, the spaceship blasting off to, to take them. So I don't know. Uh, Helen, I think you will know this one. This is uh, Sita. Hello, Sita. Uh, Sita would like to know why do soap bubbles stick together when they bump into each other and not pop? Um, so soap bubbles are a combination of an inside and an outside. And in between the two, there is there is some water. And the thing that holds soap bubbles together is that the outside acts a bit like an elastic skin and the inside acts a bit like an elastic skin. And as long as the outside never meets the inside, it's all OK. But if they do meet each other, that's when the bubble pops. So in order to stop a bubble popping, the, the rule is you need to stop the outside meeting the inside. Um, and when one soap bubble meets another one, um, the two outsides join together. So if the two outsides join together and the two insides still don't touch, then your bubble isn't going to pop. But if anything happens to make the two insides join, then they'll make one big bubble. So it's a bit it's a bit complicated, but it's all about if the outsides can join together and the insides um, can either join together and form one big inside or stay <coughs> as two separate insides. Uh, so the and in one of those cases, you get one big bubble. And in the other case, you get two bubbles that look like they're stuck to each other. Um, then the bubble won't burst. And the thing that the reason the bubble will burst eventually is that water experiences gravity. And so the water that's in between the inside and the outside is slowly draining downwards. And that means the top of the bubble is getting thinner and thinner and thinner until eventually the inside and the outside touch and then it will burst. So if you want to keep your soap bubbles alive, all you need to do is stop the inside touching the outside. And uh, it is perfectly possible for two soap bubbles to join up with each other and for that not to happen. It's better, it's easier to do it when it's humid. In dry weather, it's a bit harder, but yes, it's, po it's possible. Wonderful, thank you very much. This is a question that's just come in from Vincent. I should have mentioned, that's one thing I did forget to mention at the beginning. If you've got any questions, we've only got about 10 minutes left, but uh, you can put them into the chat. Uh, or you can tweet us uh, at Cosmic Shambles. Uh, this is for you, Alon. This is from Vincent, who says, I always wondered about paper aeroplanes. They don't go as fast and don't have the typical wing shape for lift, right? Are paper aeroplanes more like floating? No, I think... No, I think around how wings work, which is that the, the shape is hugely important, which it is. But, but the way uh, a paper aeroplane uh, generates lift is um, as it as it as it flies through the air, if it's at an angle, it pushes air down. And Newton's third law says if you push something down, you get an equal and opposite force upwards. So paper aeroplanes don't generate lift. Uh, in in the same way that a uh, aeroplane wing uh, generates lift, um, but both of them 
rely on Newton's third law, essentially, which is that if you push something, it will push back on you. And so in an aeroplane wing, what tends to happen, people often use various explanations, but ultimately what, the, what an aeroplane wing does is, is it forces air downwards. And because it's forcing air downwards, the air forces it, lifts it back upwards. So um, if, if you imagine this, if it's just flying straight across the sky, then, then it won't experience any lift because the air is just going to go on, on either side. But if it's going like this, for example, it's pushing the air down and the air pushes it back up. Um, and that's, that's Newton's third law in action. And that's why paper aeroplanes experience lift. Um, if you uh, want to investigate more interesting paper aeroplane designs, I'm, can I do a very quick, if you just take a piece of paper, I'm going to show you this very quickly, and you uh, fold the edge over so you make this side heavier, I'm doing this one handed, and you make it into a cylinder. And this, this is on my website, you can get a free uh, template or video to show you how to do this. You can make a cylinder fly through the air because it, it will produce lift. You can make a paper helicopter, you can produce lift in all sorts of manner, but essentially all you have to do is have something that is pushing air downwards. And if it's pushing air downwards, it will experience an upwards force. And that's that's the the, the, the wonderfulness of Newton's third law. I don't Brilliant. know if I've explained that correctly, much. but there you go. The uh, question from Ben for uh, you, Libby, uh, you, you mentioned your own kind of designs for your Epcot Centre on Mars and obviously about the beginning of space tourism. And uh, Ben was just wondering, do you think normal people will ever live on the moon or just trained astronauts? I suppose the question is, you know, <laughs> can we how far away are we looking at the idea of there being some kind of, of base on the moon? Yeah, and then the sort of the answer to that is, and then the sort of the answer to that is, well, well, what timescales are we talking about? And and so at the moment we are going to see people go back to the moon in about the next decade, and that blows my mind. Even that sentence, I grew up, you know, de de <coughs> loving those stories of, of Apollo, but I was born in 1981, so I missed everything by what felt like a lifetime when I was a little child. Those missions that we're going to go back now are going to be professional astronauts um, staying on the moon, perhaps for a week or two. If we get really good, um, we they might stay uh, for a few weeks. The big challenge on the moon is that the night on the moon lasts for two Earth weeks. Um, you think about how we see the moon in the sky um, and we see that crescent going to the full moon and back. Well, that's us watching day and night pass on the moon. So we've got to survive. If humans are going to survive on the moon, they've got to survive for two weeks in darkness. Where do you get your energy from? You know, how, how are you going to stay alive? Lots of challenges there. So the immediate future is just going to be professional astronauts and we're going to figure out how to live and work on the moon. But let's go back to what we've been doing in space for the last 20 years. We've been learning how to live and work on the International Space Station for the last 20 years. And before that, we had Mir, the great Russian space station, we had Skylab. So from, from the moon landings, we've gone through to, to the era of space stations. We've got the hang of it. And now we're seeing very, very rich people be able to buy tickets and go and have holidays, essentially, on the space station for a week or two. So... We're not going to see everyday people going to the moon just yet. But fast forward, I don't know, 100 years maybe? Um, who knows? I can, I can imagine that my little Mars hotel might appear on the moon somewhere, somehow. You know, I don't think in our lifetimes, but it may be, maybe the people who are being born today might just be able to see those missions happen and sort of, you know, go, wow, what have I seen in my lifetime? Great disappointment to both Brian Cox and I, because of course we we're old enough to be enormous fans of the Jerry Anson TV series Space 1999. Where not only did we have a huge moon base, but then the moon was actually taken out of orbit, and we managed to travel to an enormous number of planets filled with exotic aliens. It turns out we were misled on many fronts with that series. I'm going to caveat my four, my predictions with one my predictions with one thing, which was that when I was uh, at university, someone came along and said, "There's this amazing new file format. It's going to revolutionise how we listen to everything. It's called MP3. We're all going to be carrying around lots of you know, thousands of songs in our pockets." And I couldn't see it. So my my predictions might be completely wrong, and we'll all be doing this in 50 years' time. You <laughs> might just get there.
Wonderful. The uh, Helen, I'm going to ask you this question uh, because you're such a public and you are going to probably know, but you might not, which is uh, why do birds migrate? Why don't they just stay where the food is? Uh, well, it's because one of the reasons is that where the food is changes <laughs> throughout the year. So, th so there is um, a massive you know, the, the earth is tilted on its axis, which means that as we go around the sun, we get long days as we have at the moment or short days if you're high up in the northern hemisphere where we are. Now, if you're a species and you need lots of food, then it's great to be somewhere where there's nearly 24 hour daylight because you've got more time to forage. You've got more sunlight, which is uh, feeding more plants, which can keep more insects alive, which can keep more something else alive, which you might eat. So it's very advantageous <laughs> to be in the the summer um hemisphere because there's just more light so there's more food because during the winter you're always effectively living off the dregs left over from the summer and whatever sunlight you still get which is less um so at this time of year in the height of the summer it's a it's a very good time to be in the northern hemisphere feeding but as the days start to get shorter as the seasons go on if you can move well it's very good to move south because you're actually keeping with the maximum sunlight so um it's it's all about the food and also opportunities to breed. So the other thing to remember here is that species have evolved. They don't sit down with a planner uh, and a map every year and go, oh, where's the optimum sun insect path this year? Um, sometimes creatures go on long migrations because in the past, you know, sometimes in geological time, those places were very close together. Uh, so the um, eel actually uh, is a fish that we get in the Thames still. It's endangered, but it still happens. It still comes to Europe. Um, it's a freshwater fish. It grows mostly in rivers, but it it is born in the Sargasso Sea, which is right over on the other side of the Atlantic. And it travels all the way to Europe where it lives most of its life and it travels all the way back to breed. And we think the reason that happened is because the Atlantic was once not an ocean. It wasn't there. Um, and it's been getting wider and wider and wider very slowly over time. So originally, the place where they bred and the place where they live were quite close together. And then, you know, the earth has moved and they just kept Oh, it's a bit. It's only a bit further this year. Just a bit further this year, and so you get things like that happening as well, where you wouldn't optimise the system like that now. But it happens because of the way things were in the past, and the and it's not just geological time. It could be where the forests were or where the rivers ran. So you get these sort of shadows of the way the world used to be. Um, so there's lots of different reasons, but. The, the, the original one is almost always keeping away from the predators and near the food. And then after that, you get these shadows of historical accidents that can last for millions of years. Brilliant. Thank you. And you mentioned eels there. One day we should deal with the whole eel baby conundrum, isn't it? Because there's still a great oh, yes. history around I, how eels breed and whether. So so we'll, maybe next I've week. I've just written a whole thing about, about this. But anyway, yes, we should definitely talk about the eels. Yeah, we'll do something about eel babies. Now, uh, Alan, for you, this is uh, a question from Doyle78, who says, uh, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but shouldn't we be making more of a push to teach the idea of science and the scientific method in schooling rather than the science itself? <laughs> Um, I've written about this as well. That there has been a has been a push to do that. It's not been a very successful one. That, um, I don't know when uh, the question asker went to school, but the national curriculum changed about twenty years ago to include an element in the in all science courses called how science works. And um, it's quite a, somebody should write a book about it. That there were some some of the best science educators this country has ever had had the same thought, and and they tried to introduce this into the curriculum. And it, it wasn't a massive success. And from my perspective, which I saw this happen and I saw it fail, part of the reason was because the science teachers themselves hadn't been taught what they needed to know. So you do a university course in physics or chemistry or astrobiology or whatever. And even at university, you don't really learn how science works. So you don't learn about the history and philosophy of science which are really important to actually understanding the nature of science. And I'm sad to report that, you know, in my career as a science communicator, who've, I've encountered lots of scientists who have a very narrow view of what science is and how it works. So I agree with the question ask, answer. And the, the answer is science educators have tried to do this. We, we just haven't succeeded terribly well. And, and I don't think it's a problem just for school. I think it's a problem for university level education. And I, I think, firstly, how science works is, is actually really interesting and complicated. And we haven't done a terribly good job of um, incorporating it into the science curriculum. But there are efforts to do so.
But it's really important what's behind the question. Sorry, Robin, I'll be quick, is that um, there is more to science than the technical stuff. Yeah. It's not just the functional thing you need to know, that you yeah. need to know the history, whatever it is you're studying, it, it's got its own history and culture. And that is part of the subject. And as soon as you get to very functionally based, well, can you design a widget? You dismiss the history and culture and then you lose a lot in the long term. And that's the danger at the moment. And that there is no single science single scientific method and there are strengths and limitations to using science in different situations I mean and, and those are discussions we should be having in class um, throughout a child's science education and as I say uh, especially at university for those people who are going to be professional scientists I think I think it's a, a real failure of the university science uh, education that that this key idea is not taught at all in some places I think it's interesting with what's been going of, of vaccines over with COVID-19, et cetera, is that a lot of the scientists who've been involved with that are increasingly learning the way of trying to explain to the public what is the system that's used and you know because there have been various kind of you know some of the the, the anti-vaccine campaigners and you I think they've increasingly <laughs> some of the scientists increasingly learning ways of explaining what, what the method is in itself and how it has been pragmatically used in this situation uh but as i said you can hear more about that if uh, uh, tuesday i'm doing academy uh, uh with sarah and Catherine about astrazeneca uh, uh final question for you libby this is a tough question how many people have been astronauts been astronauts uh, that's uh for me a good question because i know the answer it's about over 500 it's about 550 55, 560 people or so have been into space so far. Uh, and that's since the first person in space in 1961 was Yuri Gagarin. What's getting interesting at the minute, uh, we were talked right at the beginning um, about Richard Branson getting in his spaceship two um, today and this commercial uh, everything kicking off. There are two different definitions of where space starts. And as people start paying their money to get into space and just get over that line, which is depending on your definition, 100 miles up, um, there's another one uh, around there. Um, are you in space or not? Does it matter? Is the most important thing that you're floating and you've seen the Earth from, from up there? Um, so there's going to be some, some discussion about where space starts because we're going to see that number go up a lot. Thank you very much. I should say for anyone watching that uh, on Cosmic Shambles, we've got loads of interviews with uh, astronauts, uh, including I had a lot of fun with uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, who uh, we did an episode as well with her uh, with uh, Tanita Tickerham, whose song has frequently been taken up into space, very popular with astronauts. So that was lovely. Helen Sharman, uh, uh, Tim Peake, Nicole Stott. Uh, so if you want to hear more conversations with uh, astronauts, we have got lots of them. Thank you so much to, to Alam, whose new book, Mr. Shaha's uh, Marvellous Machines, is out now. Libby, whose new book, Space Explorers, uh, 25 Extraordinary Stories of Space Exploration, is also out now. Thank you very much to Helen Chersky, whose book, Storm in a Teacup, is also out now. There's so many books out now. And uh, Helen and me will also be at the Stand and Calling uh, Festival, not next weekend, the weekend after next. We're going to be doing... Uh, uh, a, a, a q and a i'm going to be doing the queuing obviously she'll be doing the aing because that seems to work out best in terms of actually getting reliable information uh, i think that's about midday uh, on the saturday of stand and calling um do catch up with all the stuff with stuff we've got coming up new tips for existence i think this week it's going to be michael pollan uh, who is a, a very interesting writer uh, books such as omnivore's dilemma and uh, also botany of desire and uh, i don't know who this week's book shambles will be but there will be one as i said there's a new uncanny hour uh, coming up soon as well thank you very much to our producer trent burton uh, i hope you enjoy the weekend i'm a bit weird about football because it's not a big thing for me and i know that we as a nation uh, are pretty bad winners very often but i have to admit that because of i think what a lot of the football team represent uh, to a lot of people. I kind of do hope they win, not only for the eating of humble pie for various people who've been highly critical of them, but I do think that many of the things they're doing uh, are, are positive and uh, progressive in popular culture. So good luck on all of that. Bye-bye. <laughs>